Hey everyone. So um, yes, I, um, they they actually call me at JMU. They call me the Prince of Darkness because uh, I, I, apparently I'm intimidating uh, when people first see me. But actually, I'm just a lovable, lovable. What I'm a sheep in wolf's clothing. That's it. So <laughs> okay. and and now before we start this mutual admiration society, I got to say that uh, I think you're an oh god no 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 you wow and you told me to be on my best behavior yeah i just want you know wow the the the, the colorful metaphors are are bubbling to the surface but um anyway your uh your professor uh john gurney one of my one of my oldest friends and uh one of the things that i love about john and i think there's a lesson here that i need to convey to you because he's far too humble a person to do this, but I've never met anyone in my life that had such a singular vision and dedication to what he wanted to do. I mean, from the moment I met John, he knew exactly what he wanted to do with his career. And he has stuck with that every step of the way. And I think that's pretty, that's pretty admirable and pretty rare. I mean, I landed in, in New York and I wanted to work for Marvel and DC Comics. And ultimately I did do that, but um, I realized that, that there were things that weren't all uh, sunlight and roses in the comic book industry. And there were some things that some of my friends were willing to do that I just wasn't. Uh, there's so much politicking and glad handing and buying people lunches and dinner just to get your foot in the door. And I find that rather distasteful and and then I went off to uh I studied graphic design now you were you did graphic design as well didn't you some John no not at all I I was you know as an illustration major I had to take graphic design courses that was just like the very tail end of the era before computers so right Luckily, but I mean I, but you did you did take those typography classes and yeah, all that yeah, stuff yeah. and and I realized that there was a means to an end there for me and so I got a day job in design studios and then did freelance illustration at night and on the weekends. So, and then spent about five years in exhibit design and got to travel all over the world, which was awesome back in the nineties when you could jump on an airplane five minutes before it was scheduled to take off. I, I know that's hard to believe, but we could actually do that back then. As long as you had just, as long as you had carry on. And, um, but uh, yeah, anyway, so I've been at JMU now 22 years. And um, the, one of the things that they do when you become an academic is there's a certain expectation that you keep your, um, your professional practice going, that you don't just kind of atrophy behind a desk and just spout off like I'm doing now. So um, yeah, I've done, uh, did a few children's books. I, I stuck my big toe in in uh, the deep end of John's pool. And uh, then um, my first love came back calling, which is, I love horror films. And uh, um, I'm pretty, uh, pretty knowledgeable about the history and I got some things to show you today. I don't wanna just spend the whole time talking. How long do we have? Um, you can go till 250 if you want. Oh, 250? Yeah, that's, that's oh my god sure. but no i mean I, I we've had two other people and they just actually well, i told them 20 they ended up going about an hour so it's, it's as long as you yeah, want to. yeah i got a lot of stuff i want to show and i want to talk about how i use photoshop uh just a little more backstory before we get rolling um i'm just like john i, I was traditionally trained and spent the the early part of my career pen and ink and acrylics and a uh, little bit of oils here and there. Um, I got really good with markers. I could make markers look like acrylic paint at one time. Yeah, marker and comps, then, that was before Photoshop came in, that was the, you know, the, the tool for- You bet. Comps, you, know? you bet. And then um, in 2006, I was, I just finished up the third children's book I did. I did a series on historic space flight, like, the Apollo 11 and uh, Ham the Astro Chimp, the first chimp in space and things like that. And uh, I was, I kept my studio at, uh, at JMU and my office is an hour from my house. So I would teach and then paint 
and then come home it'd be three four in the morning and my wife said to me uh she said um am i ever going to see my husband at home and i said i've been thinking about that and i said if i can get the right equipment and get my digital digital chops where i need them to be i can sit in the living room and work and we can watch movies and she said please do that uh because believe it or not and i know this is going to be the most uh uh, outrageous thing I say today. My wife actually likes me and uh, she wanted to spend some time with me. So um, uh, I started, I switched over to all digital in 2006. So this is 15 years of, of all digital for me. And uh, I started in Photoshop and now I do, and, and uh, I'm going to talk about this and, and I don't want to sound like a salesman. So please don't construe it that way, but I've switched over to the iPad now. And I do um, 90 plus percent of my professional work in Procreate on the iPad Pro. And I'll show you some of that. So uh, how do I share? I don't use- And you co-host, so you should be able to. Co-host, hey, hi -o. But so. I should also say that I think you really, it, I mean, it seems to me from, like you kind of have come into your own in recent years. I mean, I think those horrors, those horror posters are like, I mean, it's the best, but just it's just really exciting that that you know someone at our advanced years you kind of <laughs> well I, you know the the, the the ultimate late bloomer. I mean yeah. uh, the the thing was that uh, when when I was at Pratt uh, I struggled uh, a lot early on and and kind of got better as I went. It was either that or or pack my bags and move back to Stanley, Virginia, which was not a which was not an option and. Uh, but yeah, the horror stuff is really closest to my heart. And I'm going to show you a lot of scary stuff today. So be prepared. Some of it's fun and scary, and some of it's just scary and scary. So let's see if we can do this thing. All right. Um, what the hell am I looking at? Desktop one? Did you hit a share screen button? I'm working on it. Computer plugged in, you got it. Yeah, if you hit desktop one, when you hit the share option, that'll show your entire desktop and all of your windows. And I'm doing that. Now it's giving me some kind of security and privacy business. Hold on. Huh. Okay. Um, if you're on a Mac, I know that yeah. you have to like enable a certain setting in your system preferences and you might have to like back out. I think, out we're, I think we finally got it. And and thank you. Oh, who was that? Who was that? That was the IT guy, Matt. Okay. And Corinne too. They both. Don't call me that. All right. Can you all see uh, my desktop now? Yeah, yes. I can. Right. Yes. Excellent. Yay! Yay! Can you see Photoshop? Yeah. Oh. Look all right. That. Well. <laughs> Get out of the house, is, Rick. This is the first thing I guess we're going to look at because it came up. But uh, this is a. Um, collectible package for a uh, Blu-ray limited edition movie. And I know some of you remember this thing called physical media. Well, there's a lot of old folks like us that still collect this stuff. And um, so uh, I've been working for this company and uh, they do uh, any, anywhere from four to 5,000 of the limited edition. And here's, here's one of them in the flesh and I'll show you the artwork later. But this is called uh, Cementerio de Terror. It's a Mexican horror film from 1985, I think. Huh. And um, they do these beautiful embossed and um, spot varnish slip covers. And then you pull that open and then there's the English title and my illustration. And then what's even cooler is you open the thing up and the disc has my artwork on it too. So I'm just... Uh, I'm really happy. I've done about, I think this, uh, the seller will be the 10th one I've done for this company. And they're great to work, work for. Um, I'm very transparent about things with my uh, students. And I tell them the good, the bad, and the ugly of working with clients and how they pay and what they pay. Um, they, uh, they were paying me when I first started working for this company, they were paying me via PayPal uh usually the day after it was approved which was just fantastic yeah, 
and they've gotten bigger and they've expanded. Now they have a location in Connecticut and a location in Colorado. And because of the revenue streams and all that stuff, they've had to go to paper checks mailed in the mail. And that's just a, I, oh God, it's so awful to think you got paid the next day. And now I'm waiting like two weeks for the snail mail to show up. Sometimes it, uh, it spoils you, but uh, they pay me a thousand dollars for each one of these. And I spend, you know, a couple nights on them and, uh, and I'm pretty fast. Uh, uh, recently, I've had people come to me and the first thing they ask you, three different clients, are you fast? And you have to say yes uh, if you are and you have to say no if you aren't. And luckily I'm pretty quick. Uh, all those years in advertising helped. Um, there's a sad tale. I don't know if John has told you about uh, our good buddy, John Mazzini, who was one of the greatest painters of a specific genre I've ever met. He painted oil portraits of cars. Oh yeah, really and they, reflected and kind of very 194, almost like, I don't know, like like very 1940s, 50s kind of film noir kind of style. Gorgeous, yeah. gorgeous. And, and publishers started banging on his door the minute he got his portfolio out in the marketplace. And John just was slow. He could never get his speed up and then the phone stopped ringing and he doesn't, he's not in the industry anymore. It's pretty sad, but I can do these things in a night if I have well, to. I should say, it's not that sad of a story. He switched over to insurance. Now he's like an executive at Mutual of Omaha. So he's doing pretty good for himself. You know, might, might yes, not have been yes, a, yes. Sure that's the bad I, call. He might have. I know he has a very comfortable living. Yeah. But on the other hand, if I couldn't, if I couldn't paint and draw my monsters and my superheroes and my astronauts, uh, you might as well just take me out in the field and we set me throw, loose. Throw you in the cellar with this guy then. Yeah, I'll be in the cellar with this guy. But uh, so this was done in Procreate. And then what I do is I move it into Photoshop and do um, color correction and stuff like that. But I want to show you an yeah, earlier yeah, version. Photo of this. montage. Yeah, show us the whole thing because it looks like it's photo montage or something. Well, it's um, what it is, is uh, if we zoom in on it, you'll see that. Uh, you know, it's uh, what I do is I'll make uh, shapes with my uh, polygonal lasso for stuff like the stairs and things like that. Like I used, I used a picture of, of uh, my basement as reference. Fortunately, my basement looks nothing like this, but uh, used it for perspective. And then I skewed it and made it look a little uh, more um, nightmarish, if you will. But uh so, but let me show you an older piece and I've got all the layers here because one of the things that I do that's bad and uh, I tell my students about this is I have a tendency to flatten layers really early. And it's because I grew up in a world where you painted on one surface. You know, it was a piece of masonite or it was canvas or it's illustration board and you don't have the benefit of all these layers. So sometimes layers actually get in the way of my process. So I flatten early sometimes, but this is a demo that I did in my class a few years ago. And uh, I was gonna do, uh, we, we do an HG Wells project uh, where students do an illustration based on either War of the Worlds, The Island of Dr. Moreau, Shape of Things to Come, um, Time Machine or The Invisible Man. And uh, I decided to do a digital painting demo. Uh, I had done this um, thumbnail sketch and it was about the size of a business card. Uh, and I had initially planned on doing a more finished drawing, scanning it and having it to work on for the demo. Well, something happened and uh, things got in the way and I walked in class with nothing but the thumbnail and I thought, okay, we're just gonna paint on the thumbnail. So I, I scaled it up. Uh, I think this is, uh, I usually work pretty big because you never know what you're gonna need uh, something to be ultimately. Well, this isn't that big, it's like five by eight. But um, anyway, so the way I work uh, a lot of times is I'll ground uh, an image just like we used to do with uh, oil painting. And uh, hang on a second, let's zoom in. And then I'll apply a Gaussian 
uh, noise layer to it. So it has some texture to start off with. And, and John wanted me to really talk about the way I use texture and try and have um, things look painterly. And I like things to look like they have the fingerprints of the artist on it. Um, I love Finding Nemo and, um, uh, oh golly, um, um, Brave is my wife's favorite movie along with Want Lion King. I love those things, but that's just not my style. Uh, I want something that's got a little more grit to it. What so what blending mode is that layer set to? Okay, well, um, it's a uh, it's a multiply layer. Okay. Okay, I don't have the, I have this set up in stages, so don't pay any attention to these layers as they appear. But this was done as a multiply layer um, or with a dissolve over it sometimes to give it some more texture, and then I'll just start blocking in the middle values. Now I'm a value painter. So what that means is I'll set a middle value and paint down to shadow and up to highlight. All right. Uh, so once that's done, uh, I just start kind of, you know, smacking it around and trying to get it to uh, look like something. And this time I was not really happy with that gray. I wanted it to look like metal, but I was just, ugh, this gray is awful. So I ended up throwing a gradient, uh, a radial gradient over the whole thing to ground it yet again, and then start painting onto that. So now I'll just show you those steps. I'm gonna zoom out so you can see the whole image. And you see, I start thinking about reflected light. And then, uh, as I go, I'll start drawing in detail. And then you'll see that if you look at this weapon, uh, you see it's just kind of blocked in as a drawing and then start painting over that and obliterating some of that line. Now, one of our professors at Pratt that was very influential on me was Baron Story. And Baron, uh, it's very easy to fall in Baron Story's orbit, okay, and become an acolyte. He's quite the personality. And uh, our John and I have a shared mentor from graduate school, Murray Tinkleman, who hates Baron's story or hated Baron's story. And he was just like, stop doing the lines, Rich, start painting. And uh, I still can uh, hang on to the lines longer than most. You'll see this has a little bit of a comic book uh, flair to it and start uh, painting in the uh, details. You'll notice I made a, a Martian war machine way in the back that you is do everything uh, normal layers, right? There's no transparent. You're kind of just building. I do a lot of normals and then I'll start throwing some things on top of it. And John, I will tell you, there's no A, B, C, D, E, F, G steps for me. It's kind of like jazz. I just go with the flow and whatever happens, happens. Um, so you'll see I start painting like these fissures in the earth that look like they're glowing, like they're smoldering enders, embers under these, uh, under this uh, kind of crusted over blackened soil. And then at one point you're gonna see, and then I throw another texture on it. And this was a uh, piece of corroded metal, it was a photo of corroded metal. And I put that over the whole thing so it looks like it's, uh, you know, again, so it's a little more painterly. It obscures some of the sloppiness and um, you can't do paintings overnight for clients and not be a little sloppy in places. So I use the uh, textures, I call it my secret sauce. I use it to obscure sloppy painting, all right? Because uh, John and I had a classmate, uh, Ed Lee. I mean, he would do almost an entire oil painting with a triple zero brush. I mean, the stuff was just so incredibly detailed. It was just unbelievable, but uh, I never had that level of patience. So here's this, this was done in two and a half hours in front of the entire class. And uh, I, overall, I was pretty satisfied with it when all was said and done. One of the things I wanna call attention to was repetition. There was no reason to paint these three eyes. I decided to go with the three eyes uh, as a little bit of an homage to the 1950s uh, War of the Worlds movie, where the uh, Martians had uh, eyes that had three facets, like a RGB eye. 
So I ended up just copying and pasting those and then distorting them a little bit with the liquify tool. And that's how I got the, the three eyes very quickly and didn't have to resort to painting all three of them individually. So there's that. When you did your, your layer, the metal texture, that's not, I don't see that as a layer there. Like how did you- No, no, I just have this saved this way because this is the way it was originally saved. It's, uh, hang oh. on a second. Problem is John, I flatten everything. So I don't have much that shows the actual layers. I'm a bad- well, yeah, Same way, I'm trying to find examples of like all these early stages of the sketch and layer. And I and like, you know, you, you wanna, you don't want your computer to use up every ounce of memory. So I, I clean house every now and then. Well, let me go back and I'll show you the way I'll put a layer on this. Okay, so here this is before the layer. There's the layer. Uh, so here's what I do. Um, the layer that I use pretty much 10 times out of 10 these days is one that I've kind of cultivated over the years and I continually refine it. And it's called texture with three E's now. Each E indicates a different... Uh, uh, version. So this is version three of texture. Okay. Uh, I, I love uh, uh, Karine is uh, laughing. I love that. But uh, I, I learned early in my career not to name things bad things because if clients see the file names and you use the client's name in, dis in a disparaging way, they, they get angry about that. Really? Back, back in the it's agency. Honor. They should be honored that you're, you're naming that. Well, back in my ad agency days, we had a file that went out for proofs that was called Phil's Cluster. You fill in the blank uh, version two and all the proofs went directly to Phil with that printed at the top. Phil wasn't happy. It's crazy. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I, 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 I use the word like prime and final and interim and, and, and uh, multiple E's. But here's texture three E's. And you can see it's just um, like a, a banged up uh, gessoed piece of board. And it's got some uh, a lot of nice toothy texture. So I'll get all that command A, command C copies, and then bring it into my, um, into my image and command V maybe. Yeah, this is a problem I've been having since I switched over to Catalina. Uh, things aren't copying and pasting like they should. Let me try it again. Pasted oh, there it, it is. The it went down to the bottom. Silly. Thank you. Uh, who was that again? It was Matt. Matt. Thanks, Matt. So what I'll do is once I lay that in, I'm not going to turn the opacity down on a normal layer. I'm going to use this as either an overlay or a soft light depending on what I think looks best at 100%. That's a little too much. And the soft light is nice. And then I will uh, take the opacity down there and get that level of texture that I like working in conjunction with the artwork. And that's the way I do that. So uh, I got another video. I don't, I don't think I've shown you any videos yet, have I? But here's one. Uh, Here's one, this has been a huge seller for me. I sell these at shows. Um, I don't have the rights to do this. I don't know if John talks to you about copyright, but um, technically selling collector to collector, you can kind of do whatever you want. And if you get a cease and desist order, you know what you do? You cease and you desist. But uh, I, I'm, I'm operating in a little bit of a gray area here. This is the whole fan art world is exploding and like you know i guess if they jump in and start enforcing things they're gonna if exactly if social media they'll just be ostracized the companies will be yeah. and i would never have gotten all of this professional work uh had i not gone this route because uh i'll show you a piece in a little bit and i'll tell you the story behind it but i've sold a ton of these at shows um i, I bet some of you know who a couple of these are but I seriously doubt, I, 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 now I'm looking at, wait a minute, um, hang on, let's, let's see what the name here, uh-oh, I'm seeing somebody, I can't see your name, you're under Kareen, you've got little bats on your wall or something, what's your name? Hi, I'm Gwen. <laughs> Gwen? Yes. Hey Gwen, do you know all five of these? Don't cheat. Um, 
I I I only know the middle three. I uh, like even yeah. All right, that's that. This is what separates. This is what separates the old geeks from the young geeks. Okay, so we got Frankenberry, Count Chocula, Booberry, and then the rarer two, Fruit Brute, and Yummy Mummy, and these are all the monster cereals from my youth. And I know growing up in Vermont, uh, John was not allowed to have processed foods he ate only um so, nuts health, health and, food in virginia right wasn't this uh no 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 we we fry everything so uh no, no, the, the, food, the health healthy alternative the food down here is horrendous it is just the worst my wife and i we constantly are pining for new york food but uh anyway watch the let's watch the video real quick and i'll, I'll run my mouth later but um so this one started out, this was another class demo and it ended up turning out well enough. And I ended up doing this over the period of two classes. So this is about five hours. And um, it, you know, with stuff like this, it always starts out with a very comic booky, cartoony uh, ink drawing for want of a better phrase. Although this is all done in, uh, this is all done in Photoshop. Now, as far as the drawing goes, and then it moved to procreate for the color. So this was done on a Cintiq monitor. That's one of the monitors you draw directly on. And then uh, you'll see I changed Yummy Mummy, made him a little kookier. And then you have Cintiq in the classroom at JMU? Yes. Oh, that's nice. I walked in with just that pencil sketch. Now, so uh, started putting in some flat color and then you'll see me ground it again. You see it like flashing. Um, that's just me throwing noodles at the wall until something sticks. Then that, this is a, um, a brush stroke texture. And now I'm painting into that and over that and through it. Now, do you have clipping pads established? You just select nope. your colored. Yeah, so that's got my way then. I just yeah, I'm not. I don't, I only use clipping paths to do a text wrap and InDesign. Uh, clipping paths and masking and stuff like that. It's not my flow. And oh, okay, here's, yeah. the, here's the thing about professors and instructors. I show students the way that I do it. Whenever possible, I try and show them alternates and variants. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to find your own methodology. What is your own best practice? Because there is no right way. You know what's right? When a client says, that's it, checks in the mail. That's the right way to do it. All right. And I know that that's, uh, that, that, uh, that's kind of antithetical to the way uh, some of our fine art friends um, operate and work. But I want to do good work, stuff that I'm proud of, and I'd like to be paid for it. And so I'm a bloated sellout. I'm not going to go be an executive at the Hartford Insurance Agency. I've got to depend on this stuff to get me to keep the lights on and keep me in life size uh, monster bus. And uh, I'll, to, I'll show you my home theater after we're done today. So, um, you know, it's I'm funny. Um, you, back speaking of the uh, old traditional media days, I remember. You know, I had Pete Fiore. I don't know if you ever had him, but we oh, were yeah. running. I did not have him, but I remember it. But like, you know, there we were combining like oil paint on top of acrylic and all this stuff. And like, you know, we, we were taught like, you know, in fine arts, like it's not archival, it's not gonna last. And I asked him once, like, is this is this gonna be okay? If it's gonna last? He goes, as long as it doesn't explode before you get it in front of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very commercial art way of thinking about things. Now, I'm a I'm really OCD about archiving, and we'll talk about that at, at the very end from it. I'll, I'll talk to you about my approach for archiving. Anyway, so I print this out, and I sell this at three different sizes. I have a 16 by 20. I have a uh, 24 by 36, and then I have a 22 by 28 that I sell. That's sold the least. Uh, most people want the big one. Most people love the big one, and they're like, "This is going in our family room every Halloween." We go to Target. Every trailer park across the Virginia has this hanging on the wall there. I don't think anybody in Virginia has this hanging on the wall, but lots of people in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut do. Are these are <laughs> horror cons you you saw. Yeah, 
Norfolk. Yeah, I do a lot. I do I do two big shows a year, and one of them is twice a year. So um, I haven't gone out to San Diego or any, that, that maybe eventually. Um, I've got such a great deal right now is that my mother-in-law lives in Jersey and she's right across the bridge from New York. So I can go and stay at her house for free and then do my, do my shows, which is just, it's great. So, um, but yeah, I do a, a show at Newark airport. That's my biggest show. And I'll talk to you about that in a few. It's called Jersey fest. And then I do um, chiller theater horror con uh, in April and October. Of course, everything was canceled in 2020 and i don't want to talk about it but uh here here's another video this was uh for my illustration class and we had to do this again this is another uh, quick one this is two and a half hours so the idea was to update a silent film we do uh for the final project in my illustration class we do a silent film poster and um so I did a, uh, a demo for the Edison Frankenstein. Yes, Thomas Edison, who invented the light bulb, had a film studio in, Met in um, Menlo Park, New Jersey. And he produced the first movie of Frankenstein in 1910. And here's the, here's the demo. So this was all done in Procreate. So I decided to, I said, I'm going to try and do Edison Frankenstein in a pseudo Disney style. And when I say Disney, I'm not thinking, um, oh, golly, um, I don't know, Lion King. I'm talking more about a film like uh, The Black Cauldron, which if you're not familiar with it, it has some pretty cool stuff in it. Jungle Book, I mean, the original Jungle Book is still my favorite. Disney is it so, yeah it's a little snoozy for me anymore you know okay this is over i know i know i know hey my favorite disney movie is nightmare before christmas oh, okay that's disney really see gwen gwen is like uh <laughs> gwen's got my back on this stuff <laughs> it is an amazing movie so anyway get those textures in quick it was starting to be like, oh, I think this is going to be crash and burn. Because that's one of the bad things about live demos. I, I did a bad one one time. I mean, I was embarrassed when it was over. And I went back in my office and worked till 3 a.m. and redid the whole thing. And then emailed it to all my students to redeem myself in their eyes. But you see, this could get really, really dark. I put a heavy, I double textured it. Now I've got the brush stroke texture coming in and starting to put the reflective light. Uh, reflected light is another thing that can save an otherwise uh, dull painting sometimes, especially if you do crazy stuff like this. And then when the green started coming in, I was like, okay, this, this might not be an embarrassment, so we'll just keep going. That's one of the good thing about uh... The new technology. I always record the demos in advance because if I they don't see them if they're if they're bombs, you know. Right. <laughs> well, I I like to work without a net. I like that. I like the pressure sometimes. Well, you know, it's funny. I'm before this met last semester. I taught traditional media, and it was my second time teaching it. And in, in 2019, I was teaching it and doing live demos with an Elmo. You know, so they would sit there and they'd watch it on the screen. No one was standing around. Well, I was doing it anyway. So this past semester, you know, I have three classes that are the same. So I just recorded it and they're, you know, it's like whether they're watching it on a screen, whether it's live or recorded, it doesn't matter, you know? Right. But uh, anyway, long story short, there it is, there it is finished. And, and, and it turned out, turned out okay. okay. Turned out okay as, as an update of that thing. But again, done in kind of an animation Disney style. Um, so, uh, one last thing, and then I'll show you a whole bunch of images. But one of the things I talk to my students about, and I know everybody in the sound of my voice is guilty of this, and that is getting on Defont, getting on Thousand and One Fonts, Font Squirrel, and looking for that perfect font. And you know, sometimes the perfect font doesn't exist. You have to make it. So I've been drawing a lot of these titles 
for these collectible movies. So here's the Cemetery of Terror uh, process. And I wanted to share this with you because what you'll find interesting is, and I don't know um, if we have a lot of uh, bilingual students here, but the piece was finished. It was approved by my client. It was approved by the director, Ruben Galindo Jr., who is a native Mexican filmmaker. And I woke up in the middle of the night realizing that I had spelled cementerio incorrectly, oh. <laughs> okay? And I caught that before it went to press. Thank God, because there would have been 4,000 of these printed with a typo, okay, if I hadn't caught that. So you'll see me catch that. You, I went back into it and fixed it, but now watch this process. Okay, so that's the way it went out the first time. And I'm like, oh, no. Hold on. Oh, yep, we missed an M. An N, an N, an N. So you had it right, and then you added the... Uh... Well, I had it finished, and then I realized it was the, the N, and I put the M in so I could duplicate the style quickly. There you go. So that's that. Oh, cool. Nice shot. Anyway. All right, so lots of stuff to show. So let's, let's, uh, and now some of this stuff is protected by a non disclosure agreement. I'm doing stuff for a TV show called Creep Show. It streams on Shudder and it also airs in a slightly edited form on AMC. So now some of these images, uh, I, I don't, please don't yeah, share them. Let me pause the recording then. I'm recording this. Let me hit pause so I don't have to worry about. So yeah, so here's a pastiche of an American half sheet poster for uh, Monster Zero. Um, 60s okay. Batmobile. I love the 60s Batmobile. It's one of the great greatest cars ever made. Uh, now this is an interesting piece because this is 90% photo and 10% digital painting. Uh, this was a demo in my, in my uh, introductory graphic design digital class that just went completely off the rails. I was gonna do a quick like hour demo showing layers in Photoshop, how you can combine photos and do color correction. And then it just went crazy. And I spent the entire evening after class working on this into the wee hours of the morning and then worked on it, worked on it and came up with this, this, this image that I call children of the night. Um, in the original Dracula, the, one of the great lines is, listen to them, children of the night, what music they make. And uh, so that's also from the book. But uh, yeah, this is... Um, this is almost all photo manipulation. Uh, this one was done. This was a commission from my wife. My wife's favorite cartoon, Scooby Doo, mm -hmm. and uh, she loves the 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 twin ghosts. So this is Scooby and Shaggy and the ghosts. Is it good? Uh, here's a here's an anomaly. Another class demo. This is all Adobe Illustrator. So this is all done with the pen tool, huh. the, the bane of my existence sometimes, and um, a little bit of the blob brush. Okay, cool, no shapes. This one's um, another uh, in my endless series of King Kong commissions, or in this case, Son of Kong. It's another Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. There's our friends in the monster cereals again. Full circle. Uh, Planet of the Apes and the uh, 1990s TV version of The Flash. Wait, isn't that beneath the Planet of the Apes? 
Well played. Well played. Another Swamp Thing and Jason from Friday the 13th. That was a great, I love that. Moonlight. Uh, this is uh, three characters from comics from the 60s and 70s. Um, back when I was a kid, there were these uh, magazine-sized comic books, Creepy, Eerie, and Vampirella. And they were monthly horror comics, and they were like the hosts. They introduced the stories. And I've sold a ton of these. Now, were they three separate magazines or all three? Yes, okay. three separate magazines. Oh. I, just knew, I just knew Mad and Crack. Okay, there's Night Gallery. Night Gallery. Mothra. And this was one of the earliest pieces I did in Procreate. This is me just trying to learn the brushes and figure out how I can use my texture technique and the brushes and procreate and get uh, get something uh, pleasing out of it. And uh, this is a little softer than a lot of things that I do, but it's very Mothra, so it works. Now, are you into this whole new universe of Godzilla? Yeah. And I didn't... Kong didn't Skull Island of... is so much fun. I love Kong Skull Island. Godzilla King of the Monsters was great. Godzilla 2014 was, eh, it was okay. But I can't wait for the new one. Oh, good. Because Skull Island, that poster was so cool. And then I heard like terrible reviews. I never saw it, but it was a. Uh... Loved it. Absolutely loved it. Uh, another Star Trek. I did this. Uh, I hope everybody's sitting down. I did this as a retirement gift for my minister. Uh, you know, what? What? The Prince of Darkness goes to church? Well, well, you know, reasons. Uh, so yeah, he loves Star Trek. So I did this for him for his retirement. Uh, I did this for my wife and my wife's best friend because uh, they have a, a, a major crush on Jason Momoa. It's actually my favorite superhero growing up was Aquaman, the cartoons. I like when he when he summoned the fish and the, <laughs> like, the same, like that piece of fish. Yeah. <laughs> so this is from the um, I guess was it 2018 Godzilla King of Monsters. So I did this as kind of a little bit of a pastiche of the of the Japanese posters. Uh, this was done actually for my wife. My wife's favorite live action movie is Jaws. Uh, my wife's from uh, New York. So you ask her what her favorite movie is, and she says, Jaws. All right. And even though we've lived in Virginia now for 22 years, she still has the New York, New Jersey accent with the Jaws and the coffee. And now your wife's from Jersey. Does she say stuff like that? Um, no. What does she say? She's Italian. She calls tomato sauce gravy, you know. Um, and she says calamad, right? I don't know if she says that, but uh, I, I don't have anything to tip my tongue. But she's okay. Yeah, she's well, from, well, my wife's from Linden, right? My wife's from Cranford. They're very well. No, my wife's from uh, my wife's from uh, Woodbridge. Oh, okay. You used to live in Linden. Is that where I'm thinking, Linden? I lived in Linden. Okay, that's where I got. From. Okay, so but um, yeah, she puts her socks in a drawer. Yeah, draw. Okay. Yeah, that that comes up. Draw. Yeah. So uh, anyway, um, Richard Dreyfus, who was one of the stars of Jaws, was at a show that I was set up at, and I did this specifically for him to sign for my wife. And uh, at the time, my wife was ill, and fortunately, she's much better. She's had a long-term illness, and we didn't uh, took us a while to figure out what it was. Turned out she was anemic, which is kind of funny in a way because. If you've ever read Dracula, they always think it's anemia to start <laughs> off with, but it's actually a vampire. So, uh, but she's better now, and uh, she wasn't able to go to the show. And I was, I gave this piece to Richard Dreyfus to sign, and I told him it was for my wife, and I got a little teared up. And he picked up on that, and he wrote the nicest thing ever on this piece for my wife. It was oh, really, really sweet. And he wrote, your husband really loves you. 
And I just, I thought that was really, really nice. So he was awesome. And I've been fortunate meeting actual actors can be a mixed bag. Sometimes you can meet people and they're just jerks. Um, The next one was at the exact same show. I did a piece of art for myself to get signed. This is Sonny Chiba. He's one of the great martial arts actors from the 1970s. If you've seen Kill Bill, he plays Hattori Hanzo, who makes the sword. Um, uh, Sonny Chiba is in a movie from the 70s called The Street Fighter, which was the first movie in America that was rated X for violence. <laughs> he, like, he like punches people's guts out and things like that. Anyway, I took this up to the place where he was signing and got in line and I gave it, I, I, I put the piece in front of him and he looks at me and he goes, I got to do the voice. He goes, your art? And I said, yes. And he stands up and he throws his arms in the air and he goes, wow! And he bought two from me. Oh, wow, he, good. So it's a good story. I thought it was, I thought it was it. A, yeah, you, ne- you never know. Huh. You never know. Uh, because some people can just be jerks, and I've heard terrible stories, but he was just awesome. And, uh, yeah, he bought two pieces from me. He gave me his signature hot sauce. Apparently, he's a hot <laughs> sauce spokesman in Japan. It was, it was fun. Huh. This is the other piece I did for Fangoria for uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, a sequel that was written but never filmed, direct sequel to the original uh sally comes out of the uh mental institution and actually joins the family okay it's an interesting story i'm sorry they didn't film it it introduces a character another member of the clan red who is a dwarf cannibal killer and just uh it would have been crazy and the whole uh movie is centered on sally's father's mansion like Sally invites the family to live with them because they're on the run and they kill her father and set him up in like a wingback chair and talk to him and he's dead. It's, it it would have been great, but they didn't do it. Huh. Oops, wait a minute here. Wait a minute, is that it? No. Um, here's another uh, Blu-ray. This is uh, for a movie called uh, Witch Trap. Okay. I don't know why this is acting up. Let's do it this way now. Uh, Christopher Lee Dracula and Peter Cushing as Dr. Van Helsing. This is another diptych. I learned something today. Thank you. Um, Quentin Tarantino's Death Proof. Uh, this was done as a little bit of a, an homage to uh, Bob Peake who was one of the great poster artists in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, I was thinking Bob Peake when I saw your uh, your Star Trek. There's a little bit of Bob Peake in there, too. Also, the way you've been using color lately, kind of like rainbowish fading across. You're kind of, he did that kind of too, right? Did a little yes. Thing. And John will tell you that when we were in school together, if, if I could do it in grayscale, that's how I did it. I, I, I was very reluctant to experiment with color. And only now do I feel more confident working in color. And now we're back around. So uh, I'll go back for the uh, purpose of the recording and just uh, kind of stop here with, uh, with this one. Again, uh, my, my favorite piece that I've done recently for all of the, uh, the Blu-ray packages. And then um, uh, apparently they were really happy. It was the quickest sell-through on a non-sale title that they've ever had. We sold 4,000 of these in like six weeks, something like that, five weeks. Oh, cool. So they were really happy with that. And then my other favorite is the Excalibur poster. So I'm gonna try and uh, get some light on the situation here and I'll show you my living room slash home theater. This is where I do a lot of my work now. And, um, oh, Golly, I've got a studio light that I use in here when I teach. Well, Rick, why don't you um, stop screen sharing so we can make you full screen? All right. Okay. All right. Sounds like a plan. I guess on your own screen, uh, pinned. Can you see me now? Yeah. Everything? Well, 
as much as we want to see it. Yeah, right. So anyhow, uh, let me move this light around. Ugh, it's on a very short cord. But in here in my uh, my living room, it's, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, can you see the Excalibur poster? Yeah, with those two heads. These are my life-size busts of all the classic monsters uh -huh. that I have on each side of my, uh, my, my TV. And then here, we get a little bit better light here. Oh, so can you see those? Yeah, will something happen if sunlight comes in that room? Or you're, you seem like you're in the... <laughs> I told you, I, I wrap myself in darkness. This is, this is the way I like to live. Okay. My wife is all for open windows. So we do open windows in the rest of the house, but not in here. But then here's the um, picture of uh, Night of the Demon on the silver paper. And then uh, there's the Elvira. And then there's uh, your camera up a little bit. You're kind of pointing down. Oh, okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. All right. I can see reflections. You're like holding the, you're holding the laptop and pointing. Yeah, I mean whatever works, right? Yeah, sure. But uh, oh goodness. Anyway, oh, go back over here where we can see me. Huh. But yeah, this room, um, we have the ability. There's a like a partition screen that we have in front of the big picture window. The big picture window, um, this, this was the house my parents built and we, we've renovated it last year. So I was given complete control of the living room and my wife has control of the rest of the house. So that's, that's the way, that's why this room is completely cloaked in darkness. Okay. But, uh, oh, it seemed like it was one other thing I wanted to tell everybody about technique. I feel like I covered it. Yeah, no, you covered a lot. You're, yeah, you're, you're the gift that kept on giving. Oh yeah, that's what everybody says. You know, one thing I want to ask you about is, um, you know, when we were at Pratt, like, do, do students know Dan Close's work at all? And if, if anybody's heard of this book, Art School Confidential, it's kind of, um, I mean, they made a movie of it, but Dan Close, does a lot of you know he did like ghost world and stuff but i didn't know like he, he in this book like there's people we knew or are, are like you know kent and, and george and stuff but i didn't know did you know him like very well very well here's the whole story about dan close now he was a year he was a year ahead of us but he lived next door to me on the seventh floor my uh freshman year and so we became we we became pretty tight because we had a, a shared interest in like Johnny Quest and Kolchak and those old TV shows. Dan was all about TV. Oh, huh. So we and then we had a class together. We had th that terrible advertising class. Did you take that as an elective? Not as an elective. I had enough advertising classes. I had to. In the it was miserable. Guy was so boring. So Dan and I would sit in the back of that room and do jam drawings. And I don't know what happened to him, but we did some crazy stuff. But he was a terrific guy. And uh, I'm very unhappy. I talked to him about uh, Art School Confidential. It was the last time I spoke to him. And I said, why didn't you throw me in Art, Art School Confidential? <laughs> and you know what he said? What? I liked you. Oh, that's nice. So I didn't get I didn't get in the story because he didn't want to savage me the way he did Ed and and Kent. I mean, you the Ed is brutal. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, the George. <laughs> but oh. um, I took my class to see that movie when it came out, uh -huh. and you know the movie and the strip have nothing really. Oh yeah, no, I didn't see any. Uh... That was because everything was based on real people and they wouldn't let the, the movie people wouldn't let him do it. Because huh. he could get also, sued. It, it also sounded like 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 he's in the in the story, it's like his teachers are like telling him not to do graphic novels or making fun of it. Like was he like like I remember Pasolacqua telling Kent to like, yeah, okay, if you do graphic novels, but do them like Leonardo would do them. Like he was they're very supportive. I don't know if he was just in the wrong teachers or it, it depended on it totally depended on the teacher. So um Pasolacqua and Story were very supportive. 
Um, Jake, what was that figure drawing teacher's Jake name? Jake Landau. He's in the book. That's him, right? Yes. If he got the tiniest whiff of you doing something in a comic book style, he would verbally berate you in class in uh. front of everybody. And, and gang, in a way that you have no, you can't imagine. You can't imagine the, the verbal abuse that we got at the hands of some teachers. Now, I don't know who you had for foundations because you weren't in my group, but I had a figure drawing teacher. His name was Richard. I'm not going to say his last name. But we had figure drawing on Friday. We had drawing one, drawing two on Friday nine to noon and then one to four so six hours of drawing yeah and this guy was a jerk from nine to twelve but from one to four he came back drunk and worse okay oh, worse. i thought it was gonna be better no he was awful he was the guy that in a critique would he would all right so he would he never did this to mine there was always a big winner and a big loser in every critique. And one critique, I was the big winner. And I've never, I never felt better a day at Pratt in my life when this drunken jackass was just like, this is the best piece up here. And let me tell you why and all this stuff, right? And it was mine. Okay. But he would walk up to a piece in every critique, pull it off the wall and say, and this, and then he would drop it to the floor and he would walk on it while he was talking crap about somebody else's work. Yes, Kareen, yes, you heard me correctly. He would walk on people's work as he savaged someone else's. We heard sort of one guy, this, the guy's first, kind of Stan Felipe, I forget, I don't think it's the same book, but he would like, the story once he was like, he'd come in with his morning coffee, look at things and just, splash his coffee on what if he didn't like he throw his coffee on somebody's work yeah wow it, it, it just brutal brutal now i feel like that you and i had almost completely different experiences because we had a total like you didn't did you have story yeah we had, I had story in pasalacqua okay so we shared that but you had did you have albright I didn't have Albright. I had um... Albright was great. He was a person who was encouraging about comics and grabbing novels. He actually let John and I teach his class one day, huh. which was very nice. Now, were you a, an illustration major or a painting? Yeah, major? I was Com D illustration. Because some people who wanted to be illustrators chose to be drawing majors. George and, uh, George and Kent. So then okay. they would have to take. Um, they didn't want to deal with the typography. But also, it's like the drawing. There's one fantastic drawing teacher, Sal Montano. Who didn't have about anatomy. Everything else was. They were like from the abstract expressionist tradition. They just nothing of value to teach someone who wants to render right you know, realistically. And then you and then you had people like Jake Landau that would that would verbally abuse anyone that did something in that comic book style. Meanwhile, we were on the cusp of a of a golden era i mean which george and kent particularly rode to the to the top i mean my gosh i mean george won the the eisner award for that graphic know, that novel was, he did is a it's a fighter pilot or enemy World ace World? yeah 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 enemy ace but uh if if i feel like that if people if professor had had been just a little more encouraging on the whole and not just the selected few, that uh, it would have been better for, 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 for some of us, myself included. Uh, God, uh, I think we benefited more from not being castigated so much for, uh, for doing stuff in that style. Because I went to New York to go work for Marvel Comics. That, that, was, that was the goal, all right? And like I said, I, I ultimately did. Um, I did horror stuff for Marvel. And I did a ton of um, licensed product stuff for DC. Like I would do the drawings that they would make collectibles based on. So I never got anything published from DC, but I did a, I did a ton of work for them. I actually did more work for DC than I did for Marvel. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So like I would draw uh, 
I have it somewhere, but you know what, while we're talking, maybe I'll see if I can try and find it. But uh, I, they, they uh, would say, all right, we're doing a statue, a Superman statue, but um, it's going to be Jor-El and Lara putting the baby in the rocket and we want it in the 60s style. So I would do the drawings of that. And in some cases, a turnaround, you know, you do like a front view, side view, back view. Oh, sure. Yeah. And then they would have a sculptor do that. Before ZBrush, someone would actually sculpt it. Right, right. Well, hey, there's still some folks out there that are sculpting using traditional uh, media. I've done a couple of those. Somebody want, actually, there's some uh, Buckaroo Bonsai. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I, I, I never saw it until I got this commission, but they had one of the alien type characters, they wanted a collectible statue of it. So they had me do, it had, actually it had to be kind of a caricature of this alien-ish guy, you know? So it was, it was I, I never got the, I don't think they ever went into production because they got delayed, but um, it was it was kind of a fun process just to think about how- And you did the you did the sculpture? No, I did the model that the sculpture- Oh, you did, the, okay. The, you, the, did the, you did the drawing. Yeah, I had to do a, like a character of the character in three dimensions. Got you. Yeah, believe it or not, I don't have, okay, I know what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about archiving. Um, when you're working digitally, and I think this is really important for the students, wouldn't it be nice 20 years from now, you have a child of your own, terrifying, I know, uh, Unlike John, I never went that route. I, I leave parenting to no much. Um, what? No one wanted Rick breeding. It was <laughs> no, no, and 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 wisely, wisely so. But um, wouldn't it be nice? You have a child of your own, relative, neighbor's kid, whatever, interested in art, and oh, uh, Uncle Matt, uh, you're you're an artist. What's art school like? And Uncle Matt or Aunt Gwen or whatever can go and pull out a SSD drive where they've got all their student work archived and show them work from 20 years ago. Now, that's not going to happen unless you archive stuff properly. Um, I use Samsung SSD drives. They're rated for 80 years. That means that I'll be 140 something when they crap out. I can deal with that. I can live. It's SSD that. drive, it's a separate thing you plug in. Is it like a flash drive? Or yeah, I use the I use the removable SSD drives. I have mine plugged in right now, but hang on, let me just eject it and you can look at it. Uh, they're a little pricier than the the flash media drives and those spinning removable hard drives that you buy at Walmart and Best Buy. But here's a Samsung SSD drive. It holds 500. This is a 500 gigabyte drive. Wow. And uh, I've still got room on it. Eventually, I'll jump up to a terabyte drive. But uh, I think this was like $120, something like that. Hmm. But again, it says on the package, 80 years, 80 years. Now, if you go and I've got one here somewhere, guarantee it. Oh yeah, I've always got one in a cup holder. These things are in cup holders all over my house. Sure, yeah, yeah. One of these little birds. Okay, can you can you even see it? I need something. I need something light. <laughs> so you can, oh, there, there. The shine um, of your head is working. Okay. Yeah. Uh, or do or do this. We'll see. But this thing is made wherever in a factory as quickly as possible with the cheapest possible materials, okay? We lose them, we wash them, they get dropped down a sewer grate on a street and it's gone. I don't put all my eggs in this little cheap basket because this is doomed to disappoint. Also, I'm not a big believer in the cloud. I tell my students that the cloud is a promise made to you by strangers who don't care. One of my students two years ago, Eric Messer, 
did a really dumb thing. He downloaded an iOS uh, or an OS update at the same time uploading his final por portfolio to the cloud. Apple just crashed. He lost everything. He oh, lost oh. everything except a printout of his portfolio with China marker and Sharpie notes all over it. All right. He had to rebuild his portfolio to go out in the world and get work that summer after he graduated because all he had was this draft printout. But when you and, load something to the cloud, it still stays on your, why didn't it stay at his computer? Just his computer? Because he, he was downloading the iOS or the OS at the same time. It was a oh, huge yeah. mistake on his part. Yeah. But he thought, you know, it's apples to apples. Ha ha ha. You like that one? Anyway, what did Apple say? I guarantee you, Brianna, I'm looking at you and your nice uh, torsier lamp in the background. What did Apple say to him? Too bad. <laughs> close, close. Oh, we apologize. Well, that was nice. Yeah, that's, that's it, though. But all the apologies in the world, all the king's horses and all the king's men weren't going to put Eric's portfolio back together again. Oh. I mean, what worries me about the cloud is, I mean, every now and then there's an event where destruction happens and, and you know, like my, my, my son was living one summer in Chicago, we went to visit him and he lived in an apartment building where there's no key, there was just fobs and like, or he could get a signal from the phone. I'm like, you think that signal from the satellite is always gonna be there? Isn't that gonna be, like next time there's some altercation that's stuff's going to go down. It'll bounce back, but it's, you, you got to live without depending on expecting that it's always going to be there. It's like stuff in the cloud is the clouds. Something's going to have that's clouds going to be a target at some point. I totally agree. And I know that there's folks who are listening to us right now thinking, uh, whatever boomer, right. Or what do you say? What do you say to boomers? Something. Um, okay. Somebody knows. It's okay, Boomer. Okay, Boomer. Thank you, Sam. All right, okay, Boomer. That's that's all well and good. But when Hurricane Sandy hit, one of my friends called me. He was living at his mother's because his Nest key system wouldn't let him in his own house because Hurricane Sandy knocked out everything. So he had to live at his mother's house Till the internet came back and he could get in his house without breaking a window. No, that's yes. Yeah, so. All right. And my feeling is I, I'm looking at them right now. They're over here on the table. I got a, a key ring and a bunch of keys on it. Internet or no internet, I can get in and out of my house with this metal thing that goes into this slot and turns and the tumblers click and it opens and it's unlocked. All right. Do I have internet-based security in my house? You bet. I have some things in my house that are that are worth a couple of bucks. Those busts that you saw, some people could flip a couple of those for a nice chunk of chains on eBay if they stole them. Be they're surprised that they're all actually bolted to the wall. Like the, the sconces that they're on, the busts themselves are bolted to those sconces because A, I don't want them falling off because one of them is actually made out of what's called cold cast porcelain. It, and if the Dracula fell, it would break into a million pieces and I couldn't replace it. But um, yeah, I have internet-based security and things like that. But I'm not going to take the space shuttle to the corner to buy a, a, a gallon of milk. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk. And sometimes the old ways, I think, are better. And you have to use good judgment about stuff like this. And, and you can, and Sam, you know, I thank you for the OK Boomer. You can say, okay, boomer, all you want, but I know enough to say my wife's going to be really pissed if I do another children's book and I'm not coming home till five o'clock in the morning and when I could be doing it in our living room while we're watching TV. And so I switched over to digital because I knew it would, A, I knew it would benefit my own work. And, and John said this in his very nice way before, but I'm a lot better than I used to be, my artwork. Never been better. Right? Absolutely. I'm better. 
And I'm better because digital made me better. Digital gives me the ability to do things. I'm going to share my screen with one last thing. Can we do this? Sure. And let me, someone posted a question like over an hour ago that says, do you have any favorite set of brushes to get textures? Um, I, uh, a student gave me the Sargent brushes for Procreate. Now I'll make custom brushes in Photoshop. Like I just recently made a custom brush. Uh, I'll see if I can show it to you here in a minute, but I do want to share one last thing. Does everybody see my screen again? I do. Okay. So we're going to just go back with this one because even though it's colorful, it's, it's a little bit monochromatic. I think we can all agree on that, that it's kind of black and a little bit of grayish purple and orange. Actually, I but, like the limited palette. I, I'm a fan of it. Keep I like it too, but I'm really experimenting more and more with color. So here's something that I do, and I want to show you this trick. Now, this works best when you flatten the image. Ah, oh, golly. Really? You're going to do that? Yeah, I'm going to do that. So the image, we'll consider the image flattened, and then I'm going to duplicate the layer. So now I've got two that are identical, one over top of the other. And then I can go into... Um, Q and saturation, which is one of my go-tos, and just throw the sliders around and see if there's anything oh. that I particularly like. And let's say I like that, all right? But I still like what's underneath too. So then what I will do is I will make a layer mask, reveal all, go to my uh, gradient tool, and then get the black to white gradient, use the linear gradient and pull it through and say, well, what does it look like if it goes that way? Or what does it look like if it goes that way? Oh, that's not bad. Maybe we'll just compress that a little bit. And then we have this more yellow at the bottom and it gives it a little more three dimensionality that it didn't have before. So and by virtue of doing that, I can have my cake and I can eat it too. So in effect, you're erasing with a gradation by doing that with the mask. Correct. Correct. So let me ask you that first action you did when you made that layer 18 copy, it's like you made a layer that's the flattened. Yeah, these are all flattened. Don't get confused by all these layers, because remember, I have this all flattened so I could show oh, the stages. So 18 remember? is just the flattened image of the finish. Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. Yes. Yes. And if we go back and we look at that one image that I had um, of the Bigfoot, that was almost completely grayscale originally. And then I did all kinds of, of color variations with that. Now, another thing that I will do is, um, oh, nuts. Hold on, where to put it down? Uh, another thing that I will do is let's say, yeah, we like this. All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and flatten the whole thing again. Yeah, sure. Make yet another duplicate layer and then play with a different color adjustment that I like a lot, which is the photo filter. And a lot, a lot of times I will experiment with particularly the sepia photo filter, especially if I'm doing something that I want to have that kind of a vintage look and see what that looks like. And that's pretty cool. Oh, huh. And then, you know, you've got the more like comic booky saturated version. And then you've got the one that's been hit with the sepia tone. And then rather than use the layer mask, it's like, well, I really like what's happening in the most part, but I want to bring back a little bit of that purple in the, uh, in the bell of the Martian war machine. So I'll get myself a big brush, take down the opacity, and then just kind of brush some of that back in, in selective areas, get a smaller brush. So and pull it up to, what's that? I just want them to know that you're erasing. It's an eraser brush. Yes. And then I'll just erase this fully in the apertures of the eyes. And you see, this is what it actually looks like that I've erased through to the original image. So, and the other thing is 
save as, save as, use those extra E's or version two or interim, whatever you want to call it. And you can have all these different versions. And then something we were taught in school, and, and I, I'm pretty sure John remembers this, is set it aside, go to bed, get up the next morning, make sure it's the first thing you look at, and then decide which one's best. And that's the beauty of digital. Yeah, well, another, another downside of digital, and I don't see, you don't seem to like, you You don't get really tight with the details. Like sometimes I'll, I'll like sweat over like a three by three pixel area and like make these adjustments and I'll like, like it makes, I look at it before and after it makes no difference whatsoever, but I just spent like 45 minutes that's what happened. That's what happened with me and Lucasfilm in the Star Wars poster. Um, I got so OCD about pushing pixels because they were busting my chops on the Carrie Fisher likeness. And I was just, I don't know. It just got to the point where I just felt like back when I did the, the kids books, um, there's a painting in, um, if you, I know I've referenced this before, but um, hang on one second. I've got, I got too many windows vying for my attention. But um, if you go to Amazon and we type in, and I type almost, I type worse than John does. So congratulations, everybody. Uh, I saw your typing. It, it's it's uh, it's miserable, but mine's worse. John. Okay, well, glad that someone's worse. <laughs> so but if you type in my name, okay, well, there's the handbook. I guess we'll go for books. But um, okay, the first book I published was uh, about the the. Uh, Apollo 11 moon landing and it's called Neil Buzz and Mike go to the moon well in that book there's a double page portrait of the three astronauts Neil Armstrong Buzz Aldrin Michael Collins and when I did that painting this was all acrylics this is all before I switched over to digital and that painting the Mike Collins I got the likeness in about half hour and the Buzz Aldrin, I got his likeness down in about 45 minutes. Well, the Neil Armstrong turned out to be elusive. Three hours later, I'm still painting and it's acrylics and it's starting to build up. And after a while, it almost becomes a relief. Yeah, it's almost like you're, you're sculpting it in, in paint. And finally I got it, but it was just, it was brutal to try and nail that likeness down. And that's something that I've heard from so many um, fellow artists that do these posters, fellow artists that do the collectibles, meaning three-dimensional, is that some actors are just, their likeness are almost impossible to nail down. And uh, an interesting one, you saw a piece uh, based on it was uh, Mel Gibson, um, uh, the Road Warrior. His likeness is, is just elusive for both uh, illustrators and sculptors to to nail whereas other folks seem to be relatively uh effortless for for professionals i don't know why that phenomena occurs but it does i mean the lighting on the on the on the photo you're using makes a big difference too you know it's sure because people oh yeah it lights it just flattens out everything if it's and different. and young illustrators one other thing that i will say and we're all guilty of this we spend our lives recording reality through this device, right? And we spend our life taking everything at eye level. One of the things that I see compositionally from young artists a lot that I'd like to see you think about is don't shoot everything at eye level. Think about above, below. You know, I was looking at, and, and uh, I'm not picking out picking out anything from uh, to to be critical of but i just remembered it the the that um guy holding that creature that 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 uh, alien by the neck okay that was, that was mats yeah mats where's matt 
Matt. Oh, there you are. Hey, Matt. Um, you know, that might benefit from taking the angle down and looking up at it a little bit more. Do you know what I mean? As opposed to that just eye level thing. So uh, keep that in mind when you think about composition and you think about really uh, giving something um, drama and, and impact. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's good advice. That's great. Uh, so I view bird's eye view. Yeah. And uh, well, that's about all I got. Me. Thank God I got a three hour break till my class starts because y'all worn me out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I need, a, you're, you're, I need some you're, caffeine. You're overflowing with a oh, nation and insight. And, stuff. and you notice I was I was on my best behave. You this. Yeah, you, you know. They wouldn't know. I'll tell them about the other Rick. You tell me, evil rich. <laughs> well, I tell my students that there's one person you never want to meet, and that's evil rich. Yeah. Evil rich is not to be trifled with. Uh, and I, I tell my students, I'm like, if you ever get the "Don't mistake my good nature for weakness" lecture, you're right on the cusp of meeting evil rich. Oh, I see. They can. They're welcome to, 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 to confuse my good nature with weakness. They're, they're pretty parallel. So, well, because even though, even though I try and keep that part of me buried out of sight, there's a little bit of that drawing professor in me sometimes that wants to pull a piece off the wall and walk on it. <laughs> on occasion. Definitely could. On occasion it happens. I got an email from one of my students uh, last week that's like, Rich, are you mad at me? I felt you were a little salty in the critique. And I'm like, salty? <laughs> and, 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 I, and I was like, like, come on, you know and I know that piece is not representative of your best work. And that was my second draft of the email. The first draft said, you know and I know that piece sucked. And then I'm like, wait a minute, let's just back off from that just a little bit. Let's write, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't representative of your best work. So sometimes it's good to have the ability to do a second draft. Unfortunately, in a one-on-one, -on -one, there's no second draft. Sure, sure. So, <laughs> but yeah, I try and keep evil rich out of sight. Well, we're, I, all I remember is your, uh, your, I keep thinking of your, your graphic novel for senior year. Everyone who had a button to push, pushed it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Everyone who had a button to push, pushed it. Your, uh, my post-apocalyptic phase yeah yeah well we lived in fear oh definitely I mean, yeah it's hard to you know yeah, it just seemed like the, not the it, specter of the specter of nuclear armageddon hung over our entire childhood in a way that it doesn't today i mean you know and now i mean people are way more worried about climate change than they are uh some kind of nuclear exchange but uh, that was the big fear when we were kids. You remember? Oh, definitely. Yeah. It's like, uh, I mean, when we were in college, um, I don't know. I remember what classroom I was in, but there was this, the, the premier of the Soviet Union was this Yuri Andropov. Yeah. And he and the president, Ronald Reagan, did not get along at all. And tensions were high over the it was some kind of invasion i don't remember the russians invaded something Afghanistan, probably afghanistan no nah, i think it was something else oh, but wow. I'm, i don't remember exactly i think it was some it was islands or something it wasn't the falklands but it was in that era grenada not grenada now we invaded grenada it was something it it matters not but the point was that a lot of us thought we would wake up the next day to a mushroom cloud over manhattan and that's a hell of a way to go to sleep sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I remember when and drop off died. The, the, the headline of the post was that drop off drops off. <laughs> <laughs> the post. You got to love the post. Oh, golly. They, they've come up with some, some uh, doozies. Oh, sure. But, okay, well, I got to say goodbye because I got I to gotta pee before my next class and stuff. Whoa. TMI. What is up with this guy? <laughs> okay, boomer. So <laughs> thank thanks. you again so much. Sam, I'm going to be using that all day today. Okay. But, hey, okay. oh, one, one last thing, very important. 
My Instagram is all my artwork, no selfies, no foodies, no cat videos. I am the Batman professor, the Batman professor. I invite you to follow me on Instagram and see what kind of chicanery and debauchery I'm up to. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, artwork that's done by my pseudonym does not appear on that feed and, and will not. So, because uh, <laughs> I like to keep it PG-13. Anyway, yeah, so... Did, uh, did I spell it right in chat? Can you see chat? I can't see chat. Oh, there's chat. Just one more thing to open up. Um, I don't see anything. Batman perfect. P R O F F E S O R. P R O F E. Now you've got me questioning my spelling. They'll find it. They're smarter than we are with the phone. Okay, just, Trust just, me. They, so, okay, so I but, found it. Say? Yeah. I already, you just type in your name and it's the first thing that comes up on Google. Oh, well, that's good. Because there's a Florida man named Rich Hilliard that got into a whole bunch of trouble last year. All you need to do is type in Florida man and you can see all kinds of things are happening in Florida that we don't want any part of. But apparently a Richard Hilliard in Florida got into some trouble and I'm like, damn it. Don't ruin it for me, please. So, all right, gang. I'll see you. Hopefully, I'll see you again sometime. Thank, Thank you so much. And, uh, Thank you. I I'll give you one last piece of advice. Do cool shit every day. That's all I got. Nice. Why? Thank, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gurney. Thank you so Here, take care, Professor Hilliard. No, Professor Hilliard, signing off.